My name is Benjamin Fulford. Uh, I used to be the Asia Pacific Bureau Chief for Forbes magazine. Uh, then the Japanese security police informed me about a very nasty secret government that rules much of the West. Once I found out these people existed, I knew they had to be overthrown. Uh, an ancient secret society has offered to help. They have a membership of 6 million, including 1.8 million Asian gangsters. Their other members are highly intelligent individuals, located throughout the highest levels of Asian society in Japan, China, Vietnam, and of course in all the Asian communities worldwide. They have united because they were able to show and confirm that SARS was a bioweapon aimed at killing Asians. People do not like being killed. And therefore, a fundamental change has happened in the world, which has still not made it to the surface in the corporate news. But in the intelligence world, people know that things will never be the same again. My involvement with the secret government started this spring when I interviewed former finance minister Heizo Takenaka. Dragon's Death. I confronted him with evidence that he had sold out the Japanese financial system to a group of financial companies controlled by David Rockefeller and Rothschilds. The very next day, I got an email from someone who said he was introduced by Mr. Takenaka and he wanted to meet me to meet somebody. The person I met gave me this Freemason badge and he said to me that he was a professional assassin and that I could either stop exposing people, oh no, he said I could either continue exposing people and die at the age of 46, or I could become basically finance minister of Japan. Now I have all this proof on tape and video. Uh, <clears throat> this is apparently what happens to a lot of people on this planet. They get to a certain level and they're told either you join us or you die. And most of them join them and that way they get the elite in their pocket. And that's the secret of their control. In my case, I would have probably had to do that too. Although, once I realized I had met an honest, genuine, high-level Freemason who told me there were 13 levels of Freemason above the 33rd degree, and that these people were God. There was no God, they were God. So I asked them about their plans to kill people, and they said, yes. There are too many people on the planet. We need to get rid of, of several billion. And war doesn't seem to work, so we're going to use disease and starvation. Now, I don't know about you, but I couldn't live with something like that. And my first thought was I'll have to pretend to join them and try to, you know, throw them over from the inside. And I suspect a lot of the people inside those groups have the same feeling. They hate being there, but they're scared but they'd love it if these guys were overthrown. So you got to remember, not everybody in the secret government is evil. In fact, I'd be willing to bet a majority actually want to do good things for the planet, but they're scared. In my case, the very next day after I got this threat and offer of a bribe from the ninja, well, the guy who described himself as a ninja, a Chinese secret society contacted me. It's actually an Asian secret society. It's not Chinese. It com it's Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese. It's all of Asia. Uh, and they offered me protection. Now, this is their booklet. One of them. This is the booklet of the other. Now, people who know will know this is real. They have six million members. More, actually, including 1.8 million gangsters and a lot of very intellectual people. They can mobilize all public opinion in Asia. 
So, with their protection, I continued exposing David Rockefeller. And earlier this year, I issued an ultimatum on Rents.com. The answer to the ultimatum was that the self-described assassin told me there would be an earthquake in Niigata Prefecture, Japan. And two days later, there were, on two consecutive days, earthquakes right at the, on top of Japan's largest nuclear power plant. And, I'll try to present this to people in the future, there was video taken of a ball of plasma in the atmosphere above Niigata on that day. So his answer was to hit a nuclear power plant with an earthquake machine and kill innocent people. Now I said, why on earth would I not then retaliate? Well, that would be playing into his strong hand, now wouldn't it? He controls a lot of violence, a lot of instruments of death. The people who are behind him, these uh, Sabbatean sects of Satanists, uh, would love to trigger World War III. And I'm not going to give them that, that excuse. So instead, the Chinese societies and the Asian countries, you may have noticed, have started dumping dollars, big time. And they've stopped going to G8 meetings in Davos. And you'll also notice that their submarines, the Chinese submarines, have popped up right behind U.S. aircraft carriers in the middle of military exercises. What that means is that every single U.S. aircraft carrier is a useless sitting duck. The entire U.S. Navy is useless, okay? That's a fact. Secondly, all their satellites are useless, okay? And that's just the beginning. The screws will get tighter and tighter. The United States economy depends on Asian money. They need to borrow $850 billion a year just to keep going. And they're not, the Asians are tired of paying for a country that does nothing but attack people and create excuses for war. A lot of people are wondering why a picture of me smiling beside David Rockefeller appeared on the internet. And they're saying, how did I get to meet him? Well, he was here in Japan on what was supposed to be a top secret visit. However, if he's in Japan, he's on my turf. And it was pretty naive of him to think I wouldn't know he was here and I wouldn't know where he was. Now, I could have had him brought to me all tied up with a vibrator up his ass, just like happened to that reporter for the Yomiuri newspaper in April when you got too close to these people. But I don't think torture is a very polite way of talking to people, and nor is it very productive. Uh, friendly conversation is always the best. Now, the interview may be a little bit disappointing in the sense that a guy like that is not going to go and just tell you, oh yes, I'm head of the secret government and I sacrifice children and... Uh, I'm planning, you know, to turn everybody into sheep. It's just not going to happen. You have to get, look for subtle signals. It's the rules of the game. I was a corporate journalist for 20 years. And I know that if you just ask those questions, you'll, they'll shut down the interview, you get nowhere. So if I said, why did you spread HIV and uh, why did you create SARS? He would say, to his bodyguard, gets this Fruit Loop out of the room. That's how it works. So I had to operate within his matrix. And I hate going there. I hate that place. But I had to pretend I was a friendly journalist. And I had to sneak in the stuff I wanted to ask because, unfortunately, you know, it would have been great if he could really hit him with this stuff, but it wasn't that circumstance. He was accompanied by the president or chairman of a fancy PR company. And a guy who looked like a uh, heavy-duty Mossad type who could probably kill me in three seconds if it ever came to that. I came with a cameraman, and myself. And now, you may wonder, when you look at this interview, why I was not more aggressive. The reason is simple. 
Years of experience have taught me that you get nowhere with an aggressive interview. I would only get lies and here's evasions and spiel and the interview would be cut short. What I've learned over the years is that you got to appear like their friend when you interview them or you're not going to get good information. So I'm now going to show you the segments of this interview and then I'm going to deconstruct them for you so that you can know what I think this man is really saying. State of the world and the possibility of conflict and so on. I think you dismiss these things, you know, in, in terms of whether there's going to be another war and all oh, of that. Oh, yes, I yeah. see that I've dismissed it. Isn't that you know, right? dismissed in the sense yes, that. Uh, yeah. Okay. And if he and if he asks you if you're running the world, I think you dismiss that as I well. See. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we can dismiss that before we start. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, all right. So let me start though. You, I know that you. I've read uh, quotes from you before, and I believe also from your memoirs, where you have said that you would like to see the formation of a world government. What sort of vision do you have for, you know, uh, humanity to stop war and you know, get its act together? Say? Well, I'm afraid I have to start with what you recall. I don't recall that I have said, and I don't think I really feel, that we need a world government. We need governments of the world that work together and collaborate, but uh, I can't imagine that there would be any likelihood or even that it would be desirable to have a single government elected by the people of the world. So I, oh, okay. I think whatever you heard was mis misrepresented my feelings. Okay. So the first question is, oh, he says, I don't want a government of the world elected by the people of the world, okay? That's the key, little sort of wiggle thing there. He likes a secret government of the world, is my guess, not one actually elected by the people of the world, okay? This is the key to understanding this. And he's denying the quote that everybody's heard of him that comes from his own memoirs. Um, so, that's his official face. I don't want world government, but only if it's elected by the people. Uh, there, there's a quote uh, when, if you go to Wikipedia and Google uh, under David Rockefeller saying yes. that. Um, now, the, the what I've told you is my sure. opinion. Well, I, you're the man. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the other thing is, people are worried about uh, the situation with Iran and some kind of wide, wider conflict uh, emerging from that. What, what do you think is going to happen there? What do you, what's your view about the tensions between Iran and, and the United States right now? Well, I think the first, first thing is that... Uh, Iran itself is a problem, but its relationship with its neighbors, probably from the point of view of the United States, is the thing that uh, we would be most concerned about because uh, uh, there are such different points of view in the area and um, the possibilities of conflict between the nations within the area is certainly what is of concern to our country. Oh, okay. Now, uh, here in Asia, people say that the uh, st current structure of world institutions is not fair. They say that uh, European peoples account for 17% of the world population uh, and 40% of GDP, 
but they control four out of the five uh, permanent security council seats. Uh, Asians are 65% of the world population and 40% of the GDP, so they think some sort of better representation is needed. What, what is your view about this? I think it's, it's an issue that understandably and legitimately is raised by the nations with a smaller percentage. Uh, when the United Nations was created back right after World War II, the world situation was a totally different one, and the influence of different powers uh, was very different. Um, therefore, um, I think that it is understandable that those nations with large populations that feel they're underrepresented um, have a point, and that uh, this should be addressed. Uh, I, I don't think it's something that, to me, um, is immediately a serious problem, but I do think that it's something that should be taken up in the United Nations, and that over time, some redistribution of voting power within the United Nations structure uh, seems likely and, and probably appropriate. Now, he's saying Iran is causing trouble with its neighbors, and uh, I'm not aware of any such evidence, okay? It sounds to me like he's uh, just trying to find an excuse to attack Iran. Now, on the United Nations thing, well, basically saying, you know, someday, but not now. And his whole attitude is like, it's really his decision, and it's not, okay? The Asians are tired of waiting. They're not going to wait another forever. Uh, time has run out. This is what the Asian secret society is telling me, is that enough is enough. It's, we live on the same planet, we both get rights to decide how it's run. They're tired of European domination of the planet. They want to share stewardship of the planet Earth. And the Asians want peace. They're tired of Westerners causing wars. They want world peace. That's what they want, and they want a more fair world structure. And I don't see any reason why that cannot be done immediately. Now, uh, also, I, I, you know, it's sort of difficult for me to ask this, but uh, uh, these days conspiracy theories are running rampant on the Internet. And uh, I thought you could, metaphorically speaking, take the bull by the horns and, so, you know, let me ask you what, you know, what, you know confronting with what, or ask you what these people are saying. Um, first of all, they say that you are the secret ruler of the world. Um, what is your response to that? Well, in the first place, um, you're not the first person who has raised this issue. Um, there have been people ever since I've had any kind of position in the world uh, who have accused me of being a ruler of the world. Uh, I have to say, I think for the large part, part uh, I would have to decide them, describe them as crackpots. I mean, the, the it, it makes no sense whatsoever, and, and isn't true, and won't be true. And uh, to raise it as a serious issue seems to me to be irresponsible. Now you see, that's what happens when you ask a question directly like that. Okay, um, that's the sort of answer you're going to get. Are you the secret ruler of the world? You say, well, no. Okay? So, later you'll see why you have to take a more indirect route to get the same response in a different way. So, for now, if you ask the man directly, he's going to deny everything. That's why you have to get a little bit more sneaky, as we shall see. And um, what about the... Uh uh, candidate Ron Paul, who's talking about bringing the powers of the Federal Reserve back to the U.S. government, uh, you know, to, under the presidential control or control of Congress. I haven't read about that. Is that an issue? Well, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, one of the Republican... Uh, he's a Republican candidate, and, and that's what he's publicly calling for. So, I, uh, I would not look upon that as one of the great issues that needs to be addressed at this time. Uh, when you ask about Ron Paul, you got to look at his face. 
and see, you know, the, the look, right? It's like, what? And it's like, is this true? Like, why haven't you two dealt with this? You know, but it's clear that he's so far removed from what's happening that he doesn't even know that Ron Paul exists or is out to take the Fed back. That's how far above the clouds this man thinks he is, or is insulated by his coterie. The source of his power is under threat, and they don't even tell him. And, he, and, and anyway, it's the look on his face that tells you the true story. What do you think the great issues are? Running our own country better and uh, having our own country uh, play uh, a more balanced and effective role in the world. Okay. Um, and wh what's wrong now with the way it's running? Uh, the, the U.S. government. I mean, you mean wrong with our country? Or yes. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that uh, is needed is the fact that uh, I don't. I don't think enough people in high positions in our country uh, accept the importance of our world role with sufficient gravity. I mean, in other words, I think <clears throat> the tendency because of, of politics and getting elected uh, is to stress local issues, and of course they are important, um, but I would like to see uh, more of the uh, leaders of our country uh, spend more time in un traveling, for one thing, getting to know the world, and uh, studying history. Uh, to me, one of the uh, sad things about our country is that uh, um, our leadership, to a greater extent than I would like, um, is more concerned about very domestic issues than they are about our relations in the world. In this particular case, I have to agree. There's a joke going around in the world. What do you call somebody who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call someone who speaks two languages? Bilingual. And what do you call someone who speaks one language? American. Uh, you guys are going to be left behind if you don't sort of take a look at the world, okay? The world is passing you by, you're going to become irrelevant unless you keep up. You're going to lose to people who speak two or three languages and know two or three cultures. That's a warning. He's right on the mark that one at that time, I'm afraid to say. Um, you guys are not the center of the world anymore. And the sooner you figure that out, the better it is for everybody. Um, no. What about the, the plunging dollar and the rising euro and the apparently Asian countries have been unloading their U.S. Treasury holdings? Mm -hmm. uh, are you worried about the economic situation now? Well, I think that um, that has to be related to the um, problems within our own country and, and uh, in the, uh, the ones reading about in the papers today uh, that um, there's grave concern about um, what our role should be, how it should be handled, and how we w should better manage um, our own domestic economy. And I, th I think this is becoming a, a serious issue that is going to have to be addressed by any um, politicians who wish to be re-elected, that they have to see that, that the issue of, of our economy and, and what uh, influences it uh, is better understood and, and more successfully addressed. He looked quite worried when he talked about the collapsing dollar, and there's a good reason for that. The face value of all the dollars in the world is ten times greater than the value of the U.S. economy. The Asian countries are saying, we're not going to use your dollars anymore if you keep going around killing people. 
and we're not going to support an, a an army that's just attacking us. So this is your weak spot, this is your Achilles heel and it's being attacked by the Asians and that's no coincidence. Now you'll be meeting the Emperor, is that correct? I'm looking forward to that. What, what will you be talking about? That will certainly to a large extent be his decision. Um, my impression is that Emperors tend to lead conversations. Um, I have had the good fortune and privilege of meeting him a number of times before. Um, I would hope we would have a chance to talk a little bit about uh, his views of the world and how he feels our country is um, relating to Japan. Um, but um, also, um, our family has had quite close relations um, with Japan for many years and with the royal family. So my suspicion, and we even hope, is that uh, we might also talk about uh, those relationships in the past and, well, and where they might go in the future. But, yeah, J Japanese newspapers have talked about this weekend about uh, an imminent fundamental change in U.S.-Japan security relations. Um, have you heard anything about this? 